Um, may I also, on behalf of the tribunal, the Russell Tribunal, which has been sitting for the last two days and has just held a press conference, I sincerely thank this committee and all the members for the opportunity to address you, because one of the main issues that we were considering as a tribunal was the role of the United Nations particularly with regard to upholding the rule of law, one of its principal obligations. And I think everyone in the room will be aware of the recent declaration of high contracting parties made in September about the need to reaffirm the rule of law. I mention it because, of course, I'm not going to take time reading the whole of the report, which I see is being put before you at this minute. In fact, the copy I have is in English, and there will be a French version in the long run. The position was that we, as a jury, retired to deliberate last night and reach conclusions. And as you will appreciate, sitting on a committee of this size, reaching agreement, uh, let alone drafting conclusions, usually takes a considerable amount of time. But we did manage it into the early hours in order to have a summary. We called it an executive summary, as that's the common parlance. However, would, we would ask you to appreciate that it's a draft. In other words, there may be uh, typing errors, and there may, as far as I can see, there aren't, but there might may be on your copies. And so, what we intend to do is obviously perfect this draft fairly shortly. And with your permission, we would like, obviously, for you to be able to have a perfected version. And then, over the next 28 days, within 28 days, we will provide you with an amplified full version of all the arguments which we thought we couldn't put in a summary, otherwise it wouldn't be a summary. Now, again with your permission, uh, what I would seek to do, I see you've only just got the document, one's not expecting that you will appreciate what's in it. So it, what I want to do is to try and summarize what we've attempted to do, and then read one section that is particularly applicable to the United Nations. Now the overall objective, as I've said, is the promulgation and reinforcement of your role, by which I mean the role of the United Nations. And Stefan Hessel, who sits next to me, is a well-known figure who, who was integral to the original Declaration of Human Rights and the establishment, essentially, of institutions on the back of it. And so we're not here, uh, and we want this clearly understood, we're not here to dissemble in any way at all the United Nations. Quite the reverse. It is, dare I say it, to reinvigorate all of you towards the original objectives. Because unless that reinvigoration takes place, the international community, and I'm sure you're well aware of it, are going to lose faith because the reputation, the legitimacy, and the integrity of the rule of law is just going to be undermined every day that passes without rectification. So that's the objective. We're here to be constructive in the hope that you will receive some of this critique in the spirit in which it is given. So if you have the document before you, uh, I'm afraid they're not paged, at least mine isn't, but I'll do it by paragraph number. Uh, and as I've said, I'm not going to read it all out, but you will see that the first few paragraphs are an introduction, and then there comes a heading, Israel's violation of international law. And there are under that a resume of the main sources and instruments and institutions. 
with which you are all familiar. So I'm not going to go over ground. That would be an insult to your intelligence if I just go over that. You know that. And then on the next page, there are a number of bullet points. There are, in fact, all together, eight of them, which end just before paragraph four. I'm not going to read any of those out either, because they are violations that uh, come from resolutions of the various UN bodies, as well as the International Court of Justice. So the violations that we are describing in a narrative form there are not violations that are necessarily the findings just of the Russell Tribunal. Again, they are the findings, historically, of, of this organization. So we're, we're basing very much what we say to you on, on your own findings. So I pass from that paragraph, and then there are a number of intervening paragraphs. And would you kindly turn to Roman number three, which is the paragraph or paragraphs that relate to the United Nations particularly, and again, with your permission, since it's the first time, I'm going to, if I may read it, because it's quicker, and it doesn't lead to misunderstanding. So Roman numeral three, but actually it's paragraph seven. The UN's responsibility for the failure to prevent Israel's violations of international law, which have been specified in the earlier paragraph. The tribunal faced the following question. A. Do the Israeli violations of international law oblige the United Nations to act to prevent or stop such violations? Question B. If so, how should the United Nations react? Question C. If the United Nations did not react properly, what are the consequences of this omission? So A. First question over the page, paragraph 8. United Nations obligations with regard to violations of international law committed by Israel. And what the, the habit I've had is to not re read out all the citations because you can see them written there just to speak. As affirmed by the International Court of Justice, the case is cited, the United Nations is a subject of international law which, like states, is bound by international law, and especially the United Nations Charter and general international law. The Charter stipulates that the United Nations purpose is to maintain international peace and security, respect for the principle of equal rights and self-determination of peoples, and to promote respect for human rights for all. The Charter provides that the United Nations must take effective collective measures to achieve these goals. Failure to do so amounts to a failure to meet the mandate. And there's reference uh, to the International Court of Justice again. The same idea flows from the rules relating to the right of peoples to self-determination, human rights, and the obligation to ensure respect for international humanitarian law. In the decision on the wall, uh, which again you're familiar with, we've cut, uh, short circuited it, the United Nations, and especially the General Assembly and the Security Council, should consider what further action is required to bring to an end the illegal situation resulting from the construction of the wall and the associated regime. May I just pause? It's not in here. But obviously as a lawyer, I'm particularly anxious that that judgment was asked for by the United Nations in the first place. It is a particularly strong court that gave judgment with a huge majority for their recommendations. And this is, a, a, as it were, a culminating paragraph, number 24, which is essentially, well, it's not, not, yes, it, it's not numbered there, but it's, uh, the paragraph number is 160. Uh, but it comes under a general heading. For a body not to respond to an advisory opinion of this kind demonstrates that there may be a feeling of immunity. In other words, if no action is taken when such a body makes a recommendation, how do you regard that body, its advice, 
and its status. So we regard the advisory opinion as one of the most important sources over the last decade. B, how must the United Nations fulfill its obligations to ensure respect for the law of the Charter and the basic norms of general international law? Paragraph 9. As a subject of international law, the United Nations is, like a state, bound to fulfill its international obligations in good faith. Significantly, in a recent declaration of the high-level meeting of the General Assembly on the rule of law at the national and international levels, the United Nations General Assembly declared that the rule of law applies to all states equally and to international organizations, including the United Nations and its principal organs, and that respect for and promotion of the rule of law and justice should guide all of their activities. That was on the 19th of September, 2012. Now, if I may be permitted to add one feature. Those of you who followed that debate will know that the members who were present participating requested pledges from individual states. And a number of states did make pledges. One that didn't was Israel. So again, pledges being required from individual states, we say applies also to the United Nations to uphold it. In action, not work. Paragraph 10. This means that the United Nations must do everything reasonably within its power to ensure that the rule of law is properly applied. This leads us to the conclusion that the United Nations cannot simply denounce and condemn Israel's violations of international law, since these oft-repeated condemnations have not resulted in the cessation of Israel's internationally wrongful acts. It follows that the United Nations must do more. The Security Council is fully aware of this when it repeatedly said that it would resort to other measures if Israel did not comply with its decisions. Yet, it does little more than to continue to deplore and condemn. The General Assembly has hardly been better in spite of its right to seize a case on the agenda of the Security Council, and then the resolutions mentioned. The United Nations organs have a duty to ensure respect of international law in terms of the United Nations Charter as well as the due diligence rule. The responsibility to protect, again a reference is made, and the obligation to struggle against impunity. This duty also reflects well-established practice of the security self Council itself in many other cases for over 40 years. South Africa, Southern Rhodesia, Somalia, Angolia, and Let's try. Paragraph 11. The Security Council has handed over responsibility for the peacemaking in the Middle East to the Quartet, comprising the United Nations, the European Union, the United States, and the Russian Federation. The Quartet and its envoy have failed to effectively oppose settlement building, the construction of the wall, the violations of both international humanitarian law and human rights law by Israel. It is clear that the US or United States determines the response of the Quartet to these matters and thus raises serious questions about the good faith of the Quartet. Consequently, the Quartet has made little attempt to prevent violations of international law. As a member of the Quartet, the United Nations bears responsibility for its <coughs> failures. Paragraph 12, I've already referred to a part of this. The International Court of Justice decision on the wall declares the law on a number of violations and inter of international law by Israel. The United Nations has failed to use its best endeavors to implement this advisory opinion. In conclusion, the United Nations failure to take action proportionate to the duration and severity of Israel's violations of international law, war crimes, crimes against humanity, crime of apartheid, genocide, 
and by not exhausting all peaceful means of pressure available to it, the United Nations does not comply with the obligations that states have conferred on the United Nations. The above examples confirm that by its failure to act more strongly than it does, the United Nations violates international law. The effect of these failures is to undermine the rule of law and the integrity and legitimacy of the institutions of international law. Section C, legal consequences of these omissions. Paragraph 14, the lack of concrete UN action, United Nations action against the Isra Israel constitutes an internationally wrongful act which prejudices Palestine and implicates the organization's responsibility. The unlawful nature of the United Nations omissions is acute due to their exceptional gravity under international law. This necessitate, these necessitate appropriate responses from the organization, which has particular responsibilities for maintaining international peace and security. As stated classically in the International Law Commission's draft articles on responsibility of international organization, and then the footnote gives the citation, the United Nations must stop its wrongful omission and compensate for the damage suffered by Palestine. I don't read the next section, and I come to the conclusions, and not all of those. That's in paragraph 18. There are uh, two aspects of this. Uh, in other words, this is a paragraph dealing with the way forward, some of which is implicit in what I've already read out. However, there are two explicit paragraphs. That's three and four. In our other words, the system of international justice has shown itself quite unable to bring about change. But we are suggesting that it can be achieved in a number of ways, and three and four are two of the ways that affect yourself. The referral of crimes committed by Pal by, in Palestine to the International Criminal Court by the Security Council, or by the acceptance of the declaration made by the Palestinian government in January 2009, accepting the competent, competence of the International Criminal Court. Paragraph 4. Reforming the United Nations itself. For example, by the abolition of the veto by the five permanent members of the Security Council. May I pause there? You will only, be only too familiar about the exercise of the veto in the Security Council, which is in the rest of the draft document exercised principally by the United States of America, and on the occasions, I think it's 44 that it's exercised it over the last three decades, the large majority relate to Israel's violations in Palestine. And what we're saying in this paragraph, again, we are not saying on our own. We're not saying as though we are bringing this in as, a, as something from the outside, out of the blue, we base this on representations that have been made in the General Assembly on these very topics by members of the General Assembly. The second aspect of paragraph four is the expansion of the membership of the Security Council in the hope of <coughs> democratization and a revival of the existing powers of the General Assembly as well as a consideration of further powers. Finally, there's the Russell Tribunal declares its commitment to continue its work on Palestine by monitoring progress and disseminating, disseminating information. Uh, and I add this finally myself, and that is that we actually don't want to be here, if you understand what I mean, because we want, and when I say you, I don't mean you personally, but we, we, we mean the organizations and the organs of the organizations to shoulder the responsibility that it should have done before now. And the only reason we are here is because the organs haven't done it and the international public recognize there's a huge credibility gap and deficiency. So we urge you, please, there is an emergency in Palestine that doesn't need me to underline, that has to be addressed immediately. And without that being addressed immediately and some movement, then hope must not be put on the back burner. Thank you.